there's a geologist and a map expert that lives in Bedford, New Hampshire. And one morning, very early, about 5 a.m., he noticed a convoy of cars making their way through the rather sleepy town. And you couldn't miss them because there was 15 of them, all the same with blacked out windows. Now, you would notice that. Now, what does our geologist and map expert do? Does he just say, oh, interesting, I'm not going to get involved with that. I think I'll look the other way. No, he doesn't. He actually hops in his car and follows them. Now, I can't understand people like that. Now, I'm assuming that he's, you know, clever and maybe even a little bit nerdy, but he's incredibly brave because he hops in his car and he follows this convoy of cars. I would have just gone the other way. Anyway, when they pull up, he pulls up his car, he gets out of his car, goes up to them, knocks on the window and inquires exactly who they are and what are they doing in his neck of the woods. And they answer that they are from the New England Aerial Map Society. But ah, ha ha, you see, they are speaking to the wrong person because remember, he is a geologist and a map expert and he knows that there is no such thing as the New England Aerial Map Society. So then he knows there's something really fishy going on. So he hops back in his car, skedaddles it back to his house, tells his wife she's concerned. She rings the local authorities only to find out that all the local authorities are with the 15 black down vehicles <laughs> and they're all on the job. Next thing you know, there's two light planes circling slowly overhead and they sort of get the inclination that something big is going down. Now the property that they're all parked outside of and circling over is a beautiful rural mansion called Tucked Away. And in it is Gillan Maxwell. Now I'm not gonna go through the trial and the charges and the whole bit, don't worry. Because the part that really interests me is this arrest. It was so dramatic. And it was so interesting how they actually managed to track her down. And it's also really interesting that really she didn't have to be arrested if she had been a little smarter. And I'm glad that she was arrested, I mean, obviously, but, you know, it's interesting all these things unfolding that in a way didn't have to, even down to her mobile phone being wrapped in tinfoil beside her bed. So I can't get ahead of myself. I've got to sort of take you through this bit by bit. Now, one of the most fascinating things about Ghislaine Maxwell was she never thought she was going to be arrested. She wasn't frightened of being arrested. She was frightened of being killed by dark forces or nefarious people that wanted her to not have the information that she had. Well, this is what she was thinking because she thought her cohort or ex-boyfriend, which will remain nameless because I want this video to get its usual reach, he was unalived, as we say, in a New York prison. And she thought that whoever did that, because she didn't believe in the suicide sort of verdict, uh, was going to come after her. So that was who she was trying to evade. She was actually in fear for her life, and that's who she was trying to run away from. The interesting thing is it was the authorities that were really the only ones after her. But because she was trying to evade other people, she was also managing to evade law enforcement. Meanwhile, there was a grand jury going down and as soon as they uh, approved for her to be criminally charged, uh, then within 10 days, all this unfolded. Now, Gillian Maxwell had a French passport. So she could have been perfectly safe. She could have been living her a life of luxury in a mansion in Paris and living out her days peacefully. Although I guess if she was scared of certain forces, then she wouldn't be living very peacefully. But you take my point because you can't be extradited from France to the USA to actually face charges. So, you know, she would have had maybe a little more freedom, although she would have been terrified for her life. So I guess that's not really freedom, is it? So the FBI agents make their way up towards the house and they come across these two security gates that were brand new that she'd put in and also they were bolted. So they had to bolt cut those and then they snuck up to the house. Now I'm just going to read you a little bit about their arrival at the front door. 
Two officers from the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force were also on hand. Through a window, the agent saw a woman, which was Ghislaine Maxwell, wearing a T-shirt and jogging bottoms. She ignored their instructions to open the door and fled into an interior room, slamming a door behind her. This was no courtesy call. <laughs> I, get, I think she would have picked that up. And the FBI did not knock politely on the front door. Instead, they used a battering ram to smash it down along with half of the front wall. Now, the interesting thing is they later discovered that it wasn't locked. So they didn't need to use a battering ram to actually enter the mansion. And in the process of battering down this door and actually knocking down half of the front wall, the cat... The, the house cat got a terrible fright and actually ran off into the forest. And you see, the FBI have to be really, really careful because you can't scare little children or animals or bring harm upon any, you know, vulnerable creature if you're actually battering down <laughs> a door to get into your felon. So they had to actually find that cat. They had to make sure that everything about this arrest was above board. Because if it can be found that anything with an arrest isn't above board, it can actually affect the case going ahead. It could even result in the case getting thrown out, even on something seemingly unrelated. If it's not a good, clean arrest, it can you know, affect it going to court and criminal charges actually going ahead. So they had to find this cat they had to make sure the cat was okay. So FBI agents were actually deployed for four days to find the cat. Now, the other really interesting thing about the way Ghislaine Maxwell was actually tracked down, and it was a private investigator, and his name was a, D a Dutch investigator, Hank Van Ness. And he claimed on Twitter that he had mapped Maxwell's movements across the US for 50 days. Now, some of those movements that he managed to track down, people now think that that was actually her trying to throw people off her trail because she appeared in Pennsylvania and visited a Dunkin' Donuts in the fall to, and then numerous other places until she ended up in Bedford, New Hampshire. But it's really interesting how he tracked her down. And I'm just going to read you this little bit. Now, I am going to put up the cover of the book now. I'm not actually going to read out the cover because it has nefarious people's names in the title. But it's a fascinating book. And if you do want the lowdown on all this, I highly recommend it. There's a lot of trashy books out there, but I find this one to be solid. I think it's well-researched. Well, it's clearly well-researched. It's got things in it that I never knew before, and it relies on really reliable sources and witnesses, and it, it's a great book. So if you're interested in this subject, I recommend it. Now, getting back to Hank Van Von Van. I've nearly said Hank Von S. It's Hank Van S. He described how he had first managed to identify her IP address. Now, we have to all be careful about this. By establishing that emails to her now defunct Terra Mar project, that was the um, looking after the oceans and the whales and sea life. She, she, she even did a TED talk on the Terra Mar project. You can look it up if you're interested. It was part of her image rehabilitation and it seemed to work actually up until her friend's arrest and messages sent to one of her email addresses were being opened by the same mobile phone so different email addresses uh, one to her Terramar project and then another one to another email address which indicates that the investigator knew and was in her email addresses um, he could tell that the same mobile phone retrieved those emails. Now, from that, he managed to get her IP address. From that, he was able to identify the nearest cell phone tower. And from that, he was able to map her position. So that's it. I am not opening any more emails ever again. <laughs> 
not really. I haven't really got anything I'm scared about. I'm not scared that the FBI are going to bang down my door. Um, but it's interesting that when they actually did enter the house and started searching it and put her under arrest, they went up to her bedroom and on the bedside table were some very interesting finds. So on her bedside table was a copy of the book Relentless Pursuit by Bradley Edwards. And he was the lawyer that represented 56 of the person who shall remain unnamed alleged victims. So it's really interesting because the author then was interviewed about that and he said, it's hard to tell exactly why she wanted to know what it was that I knew about her in the book, the author said. The other thing that is really strange was that the FBI agents found a cell phone wrapped in tin foil, and she was under the mistaken belief that if you wrapped your cell phone in tin foil, that they wouldn't be able to track you down. Isn't that interesting? And isn't that incredibly ignorant? I mean, it's, you know, you've heard of the tin foil hat brigade. Well, Ghislaine's the tin foil phone brigade. So let me know what you think down below. Is it, it is fascinating when you hear of arrest, when you think of someone that high profile and that well established and that rich, somehow the fall from grace seems greater in some way. It seems more dramatic. You know, it's like if it can happen to someone like that, well, then it can happen to anyone. But then again, I guess you really have to commit a crime, don't you? <laughs> Let me know what you think about this fascinating story and I'll see you again very soon. Bye.